huge and varied country, a land of many extremes, and like most of the world these days, many of the forests and rivers that once covered this nation have long since been denuded or destroyed. Within the ongoing march of humanity's suicidal battle against nature, however, India's people have regularly shown a rare and selfless desire to protect the natural environment. In 1975, something remarkable happened in northern India. The forests of the Himalayas were being cut down, which was nothing new of course. But this time, local women, whose livelihood was dependent on these forests, hugged the trees to protect them from being felled. This spontaneous, responsive action soon grew into a nationally successful movement. So, the lady who first hugged the tree, I asked him, how this idea I stuck to you? He said, imagine if I am walking with my child in the forest and a bear or tiger comes, so I will put the child like this on my breast, so that even if the animal attacks, I will, I shall be killed and the child will be saved. So this was a very simple thing. And uh, he said that when the trees were marked for felling, then we thought that I should hug the tree and they will not kill the human beings. And thus the idea spread. Everywhere. All grassroots people's movements need spokespersons. Sundalal Bahugana became one such spokesperson. As a boy of 13, Sundalal became a member of Gandhi's independence movement, eventually serving five months in prison for his staunch activism. Upon his release, he completed a university degree and began work as a journalist. When he married his wife Vimla, another veteran of the freedom movement, they returned to a small village in the Himalayas where he worked with the other villagers as a labourer and also founded a school for the delete or so-called untouchable castes. More than 20 years later he became the spokesman for the first modern tree huggers. Based in the Himalayas they became known as the Chipko movement. Chipko means to embrace. I am simply the messenger of the movement. <laughs> it was the ladies who hung the trees. I simply went with this message from one village to another, saying people, they have done such and such things. So you should also try and save your forest. Then I walked from Kashmir to Kohima, the whole Himalayan region, 4,870 kilometers on foot, without any money in my pocket. Whatever people give, I lived upon that and telling people that we have to save Himalaya. So in this way, I walked everywhere. And it was for seven years that uh, the movement went on. Having been thwarted by mere village women and a wandering male advocate, the local forestry officers went to the chief minister in Lucknow. So I was called there and they asked me, what are you doing this thing? One only asked them whether I ever hugged a tree. It is the ladies. And he said, what do these police women know? So I went to Delhi and met Mrs. Gandhi. She was very sensitive about these matters. So she called him. Indira Gandhi, the Indian Prime Minister of the time, intervened. <laughs> so there was no alternative for him. And so the ban was put in 1981. So this is our first victory. A ban on felling of green trees, about 1,000 meters. So 
this movement had a psychological effect on the people everywhere and like a bird this message flew from here to south india where this movement appeared as epico movement the tropical forests of the western ghats in the state of karnataka in southern india a home to numerous endemic species they are among the most beautiful forests in india and are classified as one of the 18 biodiversity hotspots in the world Over the years this fragile ecosystem has come under tremendous pressure from encroachments such as logging mining and development activities like hydroelectric dams In 1983, the state government of Karnataka was planning to clear fell a large section of forest around the small town of Sirsi. Their intention was to replace it with a monoculture teak plantation. Now, while monoculture teak plantations make for an arguably lucrative timber resource, there's very little that lives in them other than lizards and termites. even the teak trees can have a hard time surviving some local residents were not too impressed these trees were marked for clear shedding everything which we need comes out of the forest if we destroy the forest actually we are applying our access to the, our culture without forest we cannot live here without forest i think There is no farming at all. Mada start agit nam gade. Darikin idrinda nam gade ulishol olu anta baanu kudu. So we were shocked. Illi yuk mandala olu anta dondi. Or nalla kusha tu. Anantra namma pura vriya anta de. Yurella na ondu seri. Ella oru seri ondu anta olu ondu kudkin ondu vichara madkin or yen madu yen tan madu. Ella vichara madu. Ella oru saishan de forest yukal ji bardu. Minute oru yuk madu. Maji vijayanu bandu. ಅದ್ರ ಮಧ್ಯೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಹುಲೆ ಮುಳಿಗಿ ಜಿ ಜಿ ಎಡ್ರ್ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿ ನಮ್ಗೊಂದು ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಸಲಹೆ ಕೊಟ್ಟರು ಇದರಲ್ಲಿ ಉತ್ತರ ಪ್ರದೇಶದಲ್ಲಿ ಒಬ್ಬರು ಸುಂದರ್ಲಾಲ್ ಬೋಗುಣ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿ ಚಿಪ್ಪೋ ಚಳಿ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ರು ಅವನ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಬರ ಹಾಯ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಿದ್ದೆ ಒಂದು ಸಂದರ್ಭದಲ್ಲಿ ಪಾಂಡ್ರಂಗ ಹೇಳಿ ನಮ್ಗೆ ಸಿಕ್ಕದ ಬೋಗುಣ ಬರ್ಲಿಕ್ಕೂ ಅವನು ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಮಾಡ್ದ ಪಾಂಡ್ರಂಗ್ ಹೆಗಡೆ ಅ ಯಂಗ್ ಲೋಕಲ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ ಹೆಡ್ ಬೀನ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ನ್ಯೂ ಡೆಲ್ಲಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಸ್ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಫೀಲ್ಡ್ ವರ್ಕ್ ಹಿ ಹೆಡ್ ವಿಸಿಟೆಡ್ ಸುಂದರ್ಲಾಲ್ ಆಶ್ರಮ where he stayed for 3 months before he left he was asked a question i asked him what are you going to do after this he said sir why did you come here this is not the place to prepare servants <laughs> this is the place to prepare activists <laughs> so it <laughs> stuck to him and that is the time uh, sundarlal bhoguna ji had come here and uh, we went together to this village ಬೋಗುಣ ಹತ್ರ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಚಿಪ್ಪು ಯಾವ ರೀತಿ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಹ್ಯಾಂಗ್ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಹೇಳುವಂತ ಅವರ ಸಲಹೆ ಸೂಚನೆಯನ್ನು ತಗೊಂಡೆ ಅವ್ರು ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಸಲಹೆ ಕೊಟ್ಟು ಅದೇ ರೀತಿಯಾಗಿ ನಾವು ಅಪ್ಪಿಕೋ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿ ನಾವು ಇದು ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡು ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡಿ ದ ವರ್ಡ್ ಆಪಿಕೋ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಟು ಇಂಬ್ರೈಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಟುಕ್ ದ ಓತ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಫಾರೆಸ್ಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೇ ಹಗ್ ದ ಟ್ರೀಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೇ ಸೆಟ್ ಓಕೆ ವೀ ವಿಲ್ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟ್ ದ ಟ್ರೀಸ್ ಬೈ ಎಂಬ್ರೈಸಿಂಗ್ ದಮ್ so we we hug the trees at the time oh yeah. marala kandu anu mandavane ala ala idu dukkagittu one dinna babbi mara itta beli ola itta itto ivalu 25 va 
ನಮ್ಮನ್ನ ಒಂದು ನಾಲ್ಕು ಐದು ಜನ ಅಪ್ಪ ಕಟ್ಕೊಂಡಿ ಒಂದು ಅರ್ಧ ಕರ್ತ ಒಂದು ಇಷ್ಟು ಇಷ್ಟು ಕೊಡ್ತಿದ್ದ ನೋಡು ಕಡೆ ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಹಾಕಿದ್ದ ಕಡೆಗೆ over the next 7 years the apico movement continued to spread their environmental message and challenge bad forestry practices beginning as a spontaneous grassroots movement apico soon utilized the methods learned from chipco and others we do a lot of padyatras which means the foot marches the padyatra or foot march is a method of awareness raising and non-violent resistance that was pioneered by Gandhi in the 1930s reacting to the British colonial government's salt tax which forbade Indians to extract or even possess untaxed salt Gandhi led a long and well publicized walk across India to the ocean with the intention of extracting salt from seawater and publicly flouting the law along the way his walk was joined by thousands This brave and brilliant move politicized millions of Indians in their struggle for independence. The British government's immediate brutal response to the Dandi march galvanized public opinion worldwide and is often seen as the first crack in the shell of British colonial rule in India. As a method of grassroots education and activism, it is an extremely effective model to this day. In fact, my initiation started with the chipko foot march from kashmir to koima the 4000 and odd kilometers so smaller marches are planned every year in the tropical forests street plays educational programs and environmental theater were also used to spread the word Through this, we try to communicate the message of our people. So people are very aware, because people are very much linked to the nature. And this is in our philosophy also, that uh, the living God is in the trees, in nature, in river, in mountains. is everywhere and you can see god in these things the incarnation in many shapes so any kind of disturbance is effect on them effect on nature so they want to stop it As awareness was raised amongst local people, the Apico movement continued to grow. Environmentalism had become a popular cause, and through utilizing the media, direct action, and ongoing lobbying, Apico eventually changed both forestry policy and practice. The Chipko had already built up a, a goodwill all around in the country. among the forest officers among the politicians among the leaders so that goodwill led to bringing a lot of pressure on the bureaucracy and that is how within a span of 7 years we got to change the full forest policy in karnataka initially the felling of natural forests to plant monoculture teak plantations was banned but many concessions were still being given to the plywood factories after further agitation and lobbying by apico that was also stopped finally after much pressure in 1990 the government of karnataka changed the state forest policy to completely ban the felling of green trees in naturally occurring forests so it is gradual uh, over the years a bit of success a bit of more success and then the final moratorium on felling of green trees but it's not just bad or illegal forestry practices that threaten the integrity of the forests of the western ghat yana mountain is a huge and awe-inspiring limestone mountain containing an incredible series of caves that are home to a local colony of bats
surrounded by a beautiful rainforest preserve, Yana Mountain has six other smaller limestone outcrops nearby. In the 1980s, there were plans to turn Yana Mountain into a limestone quarry and establish a local cement factory. But we said no, nothing doing. Even a decentralized, small-scale cement factory is going to destroy the species forest. And with the help of the local people, we organized a very big movement. Like any place of great natural power and beauty, Yana Mountain has always been regarded as sacred. Consequently, a centuries-old Shiva temple lies nestled at Yana's base. Usually during the time of Shivaratri, worshipping Shiva, at least 10,000 people visit that day. So we organized a big campaign on that day and uh, made awareness, created a lot of awareness and brought pressure on the government which said, okay, we'll stop this. And that is how this rock mountain is saved now. But today, threats to the environment, and hence the forest, are probably even more imminent than they were 30 years ago. The threats are from very many angles, but the threat is from the development, the so-called development. Development is a popular word with governments and big business. Usually it signifies a disruption of the environment and local people's lives in the service of some greater common good. Industry and infrastructure are traditionally the hallmark of this kind of development. Railway lines, huge dams, power lines and factories. Those who appropriate the commonwealth of the people in the name of increasing the greater good would pass the test of having succeeded in that project if those whose resources they are appropriating were saying, yes, there is a greater good being created and our small sacrifice is worth it. Whenever I have talked to people who've been displaced by a dam, by a new industry, by mining, in the early days, people used to step aside. People used to get displaced three times over in their lifetime because there was this imagination that maybe somewhere else someone is gaining. It's, it's all right for me to lose what little I have. And yet as the countries independence unfolded. Everyone turned around and people started to meet each other and by the end of it you realize everyone's paying a price and a few industrialists, some bureaucrats and a handful of politicians sitting in Delhi are making good out of it. Now their greater good is not the greater good of all. As the 21st century progresses, global warming, deforestation and many of the other side effects of modern development have made water shortage an increasingly urgent issue worldwide. There is no alternative to water and water cannot be imported from anywhere. And now everybody has realized this thing. We are facing water scarcity in this country, in the plains. They are digging two wells deeper and deeper. In a way, they are mining water. And unfortunately, there is very little water. In India, the central government, encouraged by the World Bank and various multinational corporations, has embarked on a strategy of building huge hydroelectric dams to redirect what water there is into the cities. This when only some 30% of India's population is urban. The effect on rural people and on the environment has been devastating. In the Western Ghats, there are already six such dams built on the beautiful Kali River, and a seventh was proposed. A Padiatra was held, and the Save Kali River campaign was launched. And so far, we have been able to succeed in stopping this dam. But dams aren't the only thing destroying the local water system. In the town of Dandeli, India's third largest paper mill is perched near one of the last remaining untouched sections of the Kali. 
Every day, gallons of filthy black ooze are released from the mill, polluting the river downstream. For the humans and wildlife that live nearby, this has had a shocking effect. Not only are they robbed of clean drinking water, but the health problems caused by exposure to this pollution are extreme. The Save Kali campaign began protesting and lobbying about this some time ago, but the paper mill's only response has been to offer a few paltry tanker loads of drinking water to the affected villagers. That, and to bribe, bully or threaten anyone brave or silly enough to complain. They simply refused to stop pouring pollution into the Kali. On April 3rd, 2005, the Save Kali campaign organised another demonstration against this. The paper mill's response was to encourage some of its more hot-headed employees to hold a counter-demonstration. Some 150 concerned people from neighbouring villages were prevented from attending by this threatening mob. For those that made it there, before the pro-pollution lobby arrived, it was an orderly gathering, beginning with a puja, or religious offering to the spirit of the river. A march into town was planned to follow, but this was soon blocked by the small crowd of angry mill employees. Overexcited by company supplied disinformation, extra pay and probably free alcohol. They seemed to think that the demonstrators were traitorous troublemakers in the employ of evil foreign interests and hell bent on closing down the mill, stopping development and ruining everyone's chance of a good life and a Pepsi with every meal. The anti-pollution lobby, though, really had only one point to make. Stop pollution, not the factory. This point, however, seemed to be completely missed by the mob, and it didn't take them long to focus their anger on the man they'd been told was the main cause of their misery. After a while, they hoisted up a rather poorly made effigy of Pandaran, dragged it through the mud and shook it at their enemies. Look, look, they seem to be saying proudly. We've made a really crappy effigy here and we've covered it in dirt. How do you like that? Next, in true mob style, they tried to burn it. But only a few puffs of smoke were managed. It seems that the one thing the company had forgotten to tell them was that effigies don't burn after you've dragged them through the mud. The police, until now, had remained surprisingly neutral, but the effigy seemed to snap them into action. They informed Pandaran that the demonstration could go no further. In many ways, it seemed to sum up the whole state of play in the modern world. On the one hand, a deeply concerned, well-behaved group of people trying to peacefully make a point for everyone's benefit. On the other, an angry, potentially violent and ill-informed mob. In the middle sat the real victims. Poor villagers whose lives were being ruined by development, but who were too scared or ignorant to do anything about it. Within a week, the paper mill had stopped supply of drinking water to the villagers that had attended the demonstration and arranged for the sacking of the one journalist who had reported the events in an unbiased manner. Back at the river, the pollution just kept flowing. And we are in a situation where we are literally uh, preparing to wipe out uh, the capacity of our species to survive on this planet. The planet will carry on. It'll adjust. It'll regulate itself in new patterns. The planet will carry on regardless. But the conditions that human beings need for survival 
we are changing that so dramatically that I think our generation is going to see within its lifetime conditions become so severe for living not because people don't have enough incomes but because the ecological burden of a false growth model is catching up with us and I believe now's the time now's the time for every sane person to go beyond this insanity and join hands to just have one project maintaining the conditions of human survival on this planet and that's the ecological challenge you have X excellent Today, we have so much thinking, very little action, and no feeling. So, the modern man, technology has created a monster with a big head, feeble hands, and no heart. The, the, natural, the natural relationship between the three is disturbed. You have to make a balanced head. Balance art, balance man. And all the great men who could do some change, who could bring some change on the earth, were balanced. I think uh, once you are initiated in the Chipko movement, right, you are part of nature. So it's not that every time you have, you have succeeded, you have failed many times. But in spite of that, you know, just because we are working with nature, you know, that really gives you a lot of strength. And I think for me the strength is the, the nature itself. From nature I get my strength to work in spite of the failures. So I have come to a stage where I realize that there may be success, there may be failures, but to work for nature, there is Nothing more satisfying than that. Use your head for creative thinking, your heart for compassion, and your hands for constructor. And then you can bring, if there is any heaven, you can bring that heaven on the earth. <laughs>